Hello, YouTube. Welcome to Bottom of the Smash Mountain, a podcast focused around Melee, hosted by Jesse Wall, a.k.a. Cypher, a.k.a. me. That's me talking. Yes, that's right. I am the host of this whole thing, and I am the one who is trying to upload all the interviews I've ever done on my podcast onto YouTube. I am aware of how much access YouTube may or may not provide, hopefully a lot for those of you who are more YouTube-focused platform users. Maybe you don't like listening to podcasts on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Podcast Addict or Podbean or many of the other, other, other podcasting platforms. There's apparently more than just three. The point is, is that if you don't want to listen to a podcast but you want to watch a video of a picture, maybe have it in a separate tab while you continue to browse the internet, now you can do it through YouTube. So hope you continue to listen, and thanks for watching. Here we are, bottom of the smash mountain. The, that should start over because I didn't have the... Here we are, bottom of the smash mountain, which is a podcast hosted by myself, Jesse, Cypher003, Wall. Today, I am so happy to be joined by the lovely audience of the Alston Melee Bender and none other than Counter Logic Gaming's very own Kevin Pew Pew Yu Toy. Kevin is now a senior coordinator of Team Ops and Marketing at CLG, but most of y'all know him as an amazing Marth player in Super Smash Bros. Melee. After having played SSBM for 14 years, Kevin has transitioned out of regular competition to work more within CLG. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jesse. It's amazing to have a little operation, and it's been really cool to have on all kinds of different people. I don't want to name drop too much, but I recently had on Cy Rain, who is another notable doubles player, and... Your name came up once or twice while we were talking, definitely because uh, you're obviously, in terms of doubles, one of the best to ever do it. But it's been great to have a little bit more of an education on doubles in general. For me, that's been a little bit of a, a weak point in terms of enjoying that sort of competition in mm -hmm. the context of Melee. But it's been great to study some of what you've done here and then talk to different people about it. So I'm really excited to get into this with you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'd love to get right into it. And also on that note, I love Siren so much. He's also a classic WoW player. So just shouting out Siren real quick. Absolutely. Shout out to Siren. We love you. So wanted to ask one question about the origin side of things. I know that you have had plenty of interviews in the past where you've been able to talk about the beginnings of getting into Melee. So the way that I wanted to ask you about the beginnings for you and when you first started playing, did Melee bring out your competitive spirit? Was that always there? And Melee was the game to channel that through? So what came first, Melee or the competitive fire? Ooh. Okay, well, I always played sports as a kid, and in that aspect, I was very competitive, and, uh, I, like, as a kid, I always remember I prided myself in being, like, the fastest sprinter among, like, the first graders, you know, something, something that you can compete at as, as a young age, but, uh, that was always, like, very friendly, and I don't know, I never really owned up to, like, crushing people and never acknowledged it in my soul that I wanted to crush people. And Melee was actually kind of that competitive medium that made me realize how much I truly enjoy grinding people to dust. I love that. And w I feel like that when, you, when you're on the younger side and then you start to get a little bit older and realize that you can potentially be the best at something was that the appealing part of that in melee or was it just at first being like i just need to be better than everyone i know at this game uh i would say more the latter where i wanted to be better than people i was around uh not to say that i was the best but it, it's just really fun to to compete and my like melee world was very small at the time when i got into it i got into it like in sixth grade and it was pretty much introduced to me like as a party game, as as we all know it. And, you know, even if it is treated like a party game, I still want it to be better than everyone. Uh, and, and so, yeah. 
So then I want to just get right into the the double side of things. I also want to talk about some highlights from your singles career as well. But you are, as I've already said, a very well-known doubles player, part of the team of PewFat with the power up of the sponsorship and everything. You and SFAT are obviously world class, literally world class of doubles players. And I wanted to talk to you about a set that you might not be as excited to talk about as maybe the ones that you've won, but this is actually one that did not go your way. And I'm referring to the Gallant Melee Open Spring Exhibition set versus KFC. So mm. that is the one that I wanted to talk about a little bit. To contextualize it for myself, I am still not great at watching and analyzing doubles, so I don't need you to throw out frame data right. or, or anything like that. You can just keep it simple because I'm, I'm going to get lost quickly, but how much preparation to, to start, a, how much preparation do you feel you and SFAT were able to do leading up to that, or was it a very relaxed approach? Um, it was a very, very relaxed approach, and uh, so this is interesting. I didn't know that I was going to be a part of this uh, <laughs> this show match. Um, I, I told the guy yes, but I believe I had told him many months back, and they had to push it. And so, of course, my my retirement uh, announcement comes out, and and <laughs> like a few days before it comes out, or it might have been a few days after, uh, I get tagged in like that that show match. I was like, wow, I, this could not have come at a worse time, but I'm a man of my word and, and I'll play. Um, in terms of the preparation for that match, um, I wouldn't say there was no preparation. Zach and I have still been playing doubles, like pretty, pretty casually and relaxed. And um, yeah, still very relaxed to, to play that match, but we were still somewhat in practice. And, then the match itself happens and it's a first to five and it yeah it just doesn't go your way it was it ended in five two in favor of s2j and shroomed so uh -huh. i guess afterwards s2j and shroomed hopped on the mic a little bit and took a i would say a little bit of a victory lap but what was your what was your own reaction you and sfat after that set was over was it just sort of along the lines of hey you know what we didn't get to prepare for this like it's necessarily a Genesis grand final set, but also still had fun. Like, what was the mindset once once the match was over? Um, funny enough, the mindset was uh, we we didn't internalize the loss at all. Not to say we ignored it, but we were just like, uh, like okay, that just happened. Uh, so it kind of like we just let it pass. And we we camped out and waited for them to finish the interview because we were gonna play them in friendlies. That friendlies, uh, by the way, we did end up playing them. Uh, those friendlies later evolved into hundred dollar money matches, <laughs> and we ended up destroying them in two straight hundred dollar money matches. Ooh, let's go. Um, but, uh, yeah, and and when. When we were cleaning up the last game, Zach said to them, "Congratulations on winning the interview and not the money." Oh, <laughs> the show match was was not for money, so that that was hilarious. That's awesome. They had they had their moment, and then y'all got to have your moment. Ah, oh, the run back. I see. That's what I was going to ask about. <laughs> yeah, was there going to be a run back? But that already happened. That's cool. But I'm sad to have missed out on that. I'm if I'm being honest. Yeah, that was uh, that was a little more hush hush. I think that one actually might have been on Johnny's stream, but um, but yeah. <laughs> well, it it probably wouldn't have been as fun to watch it from S2J's pers perspective or on on his stream because everyone would be going, "Oh, you got this," and the slow realization that it's just not quite working out like it was when all the lights were on. Yeah, yeah, but that is still. <laughs> That's awesome to hear. I just love that there was that there was a little bit of a run back afterwards because I thought to myself, is there is there a way to sort of like pump up a potential rematch? Nope, already happened. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, I, this is what I heard a lot with you talking about the doubles mentality, how you and Sfat are there for each other. 
I'm sorry if I keep saying SFAT, you're saying Zach. I don't want to be that person that just goes straight to the first name thing. Oh, that is okay. Right. That is totally okay. Mm -hmm. But um, you both have talked about how the mentality of playing together and for pretty much your entire competitive careers, always playing doubles together has created a relationship that is realistically speaking, probably one of the strongest in, in both of your lives, like on and off the sticks, if you will. And sure. how that is such a big part of why you two were so successful. I guess it's just me asking, trying to find a way to ask once again, and you've talked about this before, but what is the basic mentality or what does it ultimately come down to when you and SFAT are sitting down to play doubles? Yeah. So I don't think there's any like secret ingredient really. I think we've always just been consistently uh, communicative to each other about how we want to play the game and also uh, what we want to see from the other person in terms of like their the way they contribute to the team and the way they contribute in game. So I would say the mentality overall is to try to be relaxed and enjoy the ride and kind of just uh, don't don't worry about the result. You know, the result will happen regardless. Um, and we should just enjoy how we respond to the events. So <laughs> so I don't think there's there's anything really special behind the scenes in terms of that. I think it's just been a very consistent climb for the past like 14 years. Wanted to give a shout out to Brentos, Last Stock Legends, contributor and producer, executive producer as well, who I got to talk to a little bit about possible questions that I would be asking you because as soon as I found out that you would be coming on, Kevin, I thought I need a little bit of help. And Brentos is a great person for, for bouncing ideas off of. So want to give credit to Brentos for this question. Aside from SVAT, who was your favorite teammate at a tournament? Because apparently you've teamed up with Kirby Kaze and Shroomed as well. Yes, sure. So um, I've teamed with a bunch of players over the years at a bunch of different tournaments. Most of the majors that I've attended were with Zach. Um, but I would have to say my favorite teammate besides Zach is Shroomed. Shroomed is also from NorCal. Uh, I used to live with him for a very short time in college. And, uh, I think our most iconic run was Apex 2013, I think. I think we beat Mango at that tournament, and that was euphoric. Um, but I would have to go with Shroomed. That's really cool to hear. Yes, it... In NorCal, for a certain time, it seemed to be you, SFAT, Shroom, sort of ruling the roost. But to give some kudos and shout-outs to anybody who is a little bit less in the in the big melee public sphere, who would you give credit to over the years as giving you a run for your money, either in doubles or in singles, that is a NorCal-specific player that maybe didn't get to travel as much? Um, hmm. Well, I have to shout out Alan, because Alan doesn't get the opportunity to travel to as many tournaments outside of NorCal. And Alan teamed with Shroom for the longest time, and he was actually Shroom's first dedicated teammate. And they teamed together at big tournaments up until, I want to say, maybe 2017 when, or 2018 when Shroom, uh, like, hard committed to teaming with SUJ. But up until then, uh, Alan was always such an amazing player when it came to teaming with Dewan and causing chaos, and he really knew how to beat players that were really confident, and on paper, you know, maybe they should beat him in singles, but he was always really good at being aggressive and just being a great teammate. So I'm, I'm going to shout out Alan here. That's really cool. This is the Alan that was in the Last Talk Legends video about doubles and Genesis 3 in NorCal, right? Actually, yes. I do believe that was him, and he was wearing a very cute white shirt, I believe. <laughs> and 
that was a that was a great video of course it helped to like watching it again more recently really helped me to understand again just what the big appeal and draw of playing in, in doubles is like but we have covered i feel like we've covered a decent amount of, of doubles conversation wanted to talk to you about singles and that competition side of things in the context of the set versus soon say in smash summit 10 smash summit 10 excuse me in pools up to that point you were 0 and 3 in the pool and then it's time to play against soon say and this is in the context of slippy melee online rollback so this is not this is not in the delay based era very short lived thankfully shout outs to fizzy and the entire slip project slippy team but you didn't start off super great in that set when you lost game one, but then you clutched out the next three, including a three-stock comeback on FD. So I think you're able to recall a few of the details. I ha I surprised you with the set. We didn't talk about this before we started <laughs> recording, but uh -huh. do you remember? Do you remember where you were in terms of mindset or feelings or or just being in your room and not in front of a in front of either a crowd uh, that's super big like Genesis or a locals crowd. Yeah, absolutely. I actually remember that set in particular very, very vividly. Um, so, also really quick, I believe this was in the the rollback uh, era. Uh, I, I think you might have mentioned something about it not being in the rollback era. But anyways, um, My bad. <laughs> for, My bad. for the set... Um, yeah, so I was down 0-3 in the pool. I had lost to none, face roll, and... Hungrybox, I think? Okay, okay, yeah, and Hungrybox. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I was down 0-3. Um, I didn't think there was a chance that I could make it out. And so when you are at the moment where you're like, oh, shit, I'm probably not going to make it out, that's actually usually the time that I'm going to get, like, untilted. So I, I was... I wasn't, like, tilted at 0-3. I was just a little tense. Going into the Sunsei set, he just was, like, on fire, and he, like, destroyed me in the first game, and I was like, oh, shit, like, I'm, I'm really getting run over right here. Okay, it's time to, like, play a little, a little less honorable, and I took him to FD, and I just remember being like, oh, my God, I, like, can't find anything. <laughs> this is, this sucks. Um, we, I was, as I said, I was just really, really tense, but I managed to clutch that one out by playing really slow and kind of making him want to attack. I kind of get the feeling that Sunsei is a little high strung when it comes to closing out games versus floaties. Um, like, especially against Marth and Sheik, I think, um, of course no slight to him, but I think that's just one of those things that hold get over time. And I just remember in the last game, I was getting destroyed. I just couldn't get out of the corner. And uh, I don't even know how I pulled that, that set out of my ass because I really felt like I lost like three of those four games. <laughs> but I guess I guess like I, I took FD back from, from nothing. And that last game was just an absolute like corner camping. I wouldn't say cheese fest, but I, I definitely did not play as I normally do, and I just barely scraped by on that one. For the, the last game on the second Dreamland game to close it out 3-1 in your favor, it was forward throw, forward throw, forward smash, which surprised me because in an uh, interview in the long past with one, one of your many interviews with Tafo, who is a great interviewer, all of a sudden I was thinking, wow, Tafo is fantastic at this. But anyway, you had said, yeah, I only really like to up throw with Marth, but that has changed because in this set alone seemed to be a little bit more variety. Was that an intentional choice of over time in your coaching sessions with Coach Bobby? Or did you did you maybe perhaps accidentally forward throw twice? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, so I, at certain percents, especially on Dreamland, I don't like to go for up throw these days because... All the all the players know how to get out of uh, get out of Marth like platform traps with the proper smash di unless you hit like a late tipper up up tilt 
And to do that on a Dreamland platform is kind of like, uh, at certain percents, you kind of have to guess or commit right after the throw to like a deep wave dash or something like that. And so to just simplify it for myself and so that I didn't have to do any like guesswork or anything, I was just going to dribble him on the floor like a basketball. And and you said something about uh, with Bobby. Yeah, Bobby and I have talked about this and we've both affirmed that like, yeah, like we should just throw foxes on the ground uh, to, to throw them for a loop and to make it way easier on on doing a platform tech chase so yeah i, I guess i uh in the past when people didn't have that kind of di and awareness yeah i'm gonna throw them on the platform every time but times have changed indeed you could you could almost make the argument and i apologize to Mar uh, to armada but you can almost make the argument that the meta has indeed involved here in the in the online era it seems as if and i don't want to make it too broad of a stroke it just seems as if that there are a lot of improvements happening really, really fast just because of all the tournaments that can happen and that rollback is is good enough, which is amazing, that that competition can occur and occur well. But I'm just curious from your own perspective, since I have observed that you played in not not like you didn't compete at all, but you competed less for sure starting in the the beginning of the pandemic and then rolling forward into now with your you're taking a step back but what was that process for you when you're coming off of genesis and then covid hits yeah that's a great question um that was really tough for me mentally because uh it's well first of all i was pretty burnt out on travel and so i was like okay you know maybe this could be a good thing um, but the tournaments were all on the shitty online, and they weren't on Slippy, and that was horrible, and, like, you know, I was trying to fight against Falcos at 120 ping. I don't know if you've ever seen, I think it was the Pound online set between Bones, I believe? Bones and I? When when we played on FD, he was just running through and forward being me. In neutral because he knew I couldn't stop it. I was like, oh my god, this is horrible. I can't believe this is the game I'm playing right now. Um, but <laughs> uh, so so I, I didn't really feel the best about entering things online and I didn't really have the best attitude about it. Granted, I don't think a lot of people had the best attitude about it because it was just logistically not ideal and of course we're also getting accustomed to the pandemic at that time so it's a it's like a mix of frustration and suboptimal settings but even when slippy came around um i wouldn't say i was exactly thrilled to continue to compete and i think that's one of the big signs that was one of the big signs for me to kind of like start making steps to take a step back from playing professionally. Not just the fact that it was, oh, I don't really, even still, even with the amazing rollback, certainly better than delay-based, but that wasn't just the only thing. Up to now, you're thinking, I've competed for 13, going on 14 years, and I have accomplished a lot, certainly, and there are other things that I have either thought about doing for a while or maybe I'm just now starting to think about in the context of having having much more time at home as compared to traveling a lot and thinking uh, do I really want to travel as much as I used to all of those sort of questions that are swirling so what was the process like for you and it probably didn't happen all in one day or in one week but what was that process like for you overall of where you were coming from in terms of thinking I not only am thinking about taking a step back, but I also need to think about what to take a step into. Right. That's a great question. Um, so I have always been like a futurist and I've always been someone who's thinking about uh, the next step. Even, even before I've taken the actual step, I'm, I'm thinking about the next step for better and for worse. Um, and so ever since I would say probably my, probably in 2015, 
or 2014 is when I started to think about converting my Smash career into a professional career. And I just didn't really know how that was going to look and what the timing of that would be and all that. And so that's why, you know, from 2014 to 2021, it's taken like six, seven years uh, for this to come to fruition. But I think I just started to notice a lot of signs that I was getting very exhausted by competing. And that was also in tandem with kind of my desire to want to get my professional life on on the rise and pick up some momentum. And uh, all of this to kind of service my life goal. And like my life goal is to just make sure right now my immediate life goal is to make sure that the esports world is more aware of like mental health kind of stuff um and so i felt that as a player i can service that goal for a few years but i can truly get my hands dirty and work on you know my life mission from a professional you know as i'm doing internally kind of ordeal in esports in the 1HP YouTube channel, there was a live stream of you, Dr. Dr. Matt, and SFAT, and you're all talking about different things. And one of the things that you said about that you noticed right away in this month or so after having announced your, your quote-unquote retirement, just this feeling of, oh, like almost like I can actually relax all of the muscles somehow, or there's like this this slight adrenaline that's been pumping somehow this entire time and now that that's finally relaxing and and weaning off as well almost it reminded me of hearing nfl players talking about how there's an off season and they don't play football but it's almost as if they're playing football constantly because of how on edge they have to be at all times thinking about the next day of training and then the next day of camp the next day of of actual competition where they're running into each other at a million miles an hour and it sort of reminded me of that when you were talking about what you were feeling in this month or so after having announced, again, quote unquote, retirement. But why do you think, why do you think that you felt the immediate relief? Is it just because you've been looking forward to this for a long time, or, or what was that feeling coming from, from in your opinion? Yeah, that is a great question. I think that, um, so I guess for additional context, what, what I had said in the interview on the 1HP YouTube channel is that it's pretty much like when six o'clock rolls around now, like bam, I can clock out uh, and I can mentally clock out. But when I was still signed as a professional player, it's like, you know, let's say 6 p.m. rolls around and that's my time to stop playing, but my mind is never going to get off of it. And I'm constantly thinking about, oh man, I'm using so-and-so hours to do so-and-so things. And those hours are not being spent on improving at Super Smash Brothers Melee. And, you know, I should be thinking about this. Maybe I shouldn't watch Lord of the Rings extended cut tonight because that's like four and a half hours where I could be practicing, improving, yada, yada, yada. And what's funny is the majority of the time that this is on my mind, like late at night or after a day's work, I'm not even making progress. Like I, I'm just kind of worrying and kind of just being an anxious wreck. Uh, and so I think now, and as I said, I've, I've played this game for 14 years, been a pro player for five and a half, almost six years. Um, I don't think at any point has my brain been able to shut off as much as it can now and there is such a sense of calm and <laughs> and it's just really nice right now i i can't lie i'm extremely happy right now because i'm not putting this needless pressure on myself and uh i, I i'm happy because uh, a big thing about me being a futurist for better or worse is that you know i'm thinking okay in the future I just have to accomplish this. I need to get this done and then I can relax. But for every single moment leading up till now, 
as soon as I've gotten that next thing, I'm already still worried about what's next. And, and so uh, I finally come to a point in my life that I feel like I can, I can relax, actually. <laughs> That's really amazing to hear. That's really, really cool. I, I'm sure that in the conversations that you've had with not only SFAT and your family, loved ones, Coach Bobby, people that are directly around you, other players as well. I'm sure you get the opportunity to talk shop, if you will. And that's probably something that's shared amongst a lot of the longer-term Melee players. But that is still really cool to hear that you're actually really happy and excited about this new turn, this new change in direction or, or the, the next step of your life journey. That is That is super, super cool to hear about, especially since it's not a feeling of, regret or that you didn't accomplish enough somehow but you're just happy to have that ability to rest so much better than you have in in years literal de almost a decade and a half yeah uh it and another funny thing about that is um i'm not sure if all melee players feel the same way that i felt about it but uh i didn't even realize that i really felt that way until i stopped like, I it was such a normal part of my life that I kind of was just like, oh yeah, this is normal. Like, this like anxious struggle that's constantly going on in my head, this is very normal. But now that I'm like kind of out of it, I'm like, whoa, like I, I was in that for many years. <laughs> and I'm sure that in the context of the pandemic where there's already a lot, of, there's just a lot of things to be in that general state of, I can't stop worrying. Like, I just can't turn off that part of my brain that that being on top of everything else was probably at least a part of all of this process of going, you know what? Yes, I'm, I'm ready to step into something else and I'm ready to step away from this, but I don't want to make it seem like you're, you're, you're never going to pick up the sticks again or anything like that. You, you play even now and it's just probably a lot more fun. And also when you get to take a hundred dollars off every set, that's probably pretty fun too. <laughs> oh yeah. That's, that's extremely fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I've been playing a lot online and I don't really plan to enter a tournament anytime soon, but I've just been really enjoying like screwing around. Um, and I really don't feel the pressure of like, oh, I haven't played Marth in a while. I should really focus on him. Like, I, I've been like a Captain Falcon main for like three weeks now. And uh, Let's I'm go. not like, worried about it at all. <laughs> so it's good. That is really fun to hear about. Yeah. <laughs> I've always had this amazing pocket Captain Falcon. And now now all of these unranked people are ready to ready to see it. <laughs> Yeah. Or they better be ready to see it, I mean. Excuse me. The the one last question about this this concept of taking a step back, if you will. One of the goals that you would have named in the past, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is top ten in the ranking of, of singles for or for like the MPGR. And I'm not sure if that ever happened for you, so you can correct me if I'm wrong on that as well. But it doesn't look like it it did based on my limited research. So what do you think about the different goals that you've made in regards to Melee from the beginning up until now, where a lot of goals were crushed, just absolutely crushed. So there's there's, this is not me saying, oh, you think you didn't do enough? You, you've done so much for Melee and through Melee, so that is super, super cool. Not trying to make it otherwise, but I guess <laughs> that's the one thing I am curious about, the, the idea that there were some goals, whether it's the top 10 thing or otherwise, that weren't met and how you feel about it. For sure. So to answer the top 10 thing, I actually did get top 10. I got 10th one time in like 2012 on the Melee on Me rankings. And um, so yeah, there's that. Unfortunately, I never got to break into the single digit and that was one of my goals. Um, but the beauty of goals is that they can always change and it always depends on how goddamn stubborn you are or you know, what your priorities are, and so um, the top 10 goal, re-entering the top 10, was a goal of mine for many years, which I did not accomplish, by the way, um, <laughs> after after I, I had made that one top 10 appearance. 
Um, and that was, that was a goal, and that was, like, a North Star, something to constantly be pushing for, and when you need to ask yourself your why, that can be part of the answer to why you continue to do this thing that is, uh, so hard to do. But in terms of some of the other goals, um, like, one of my goals was to beat Armada. Never got to do that. Um... <laughs> Another one of my goals was to beat Mewtwo King in a Marth Ditto, uh, like, very late into a tournament in a best of five format. Never got to do that either. And I think another one of my goals was to just make it to grand finals at a major, and I also didn't get to do that. <laughs> but, you know, that's okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not beat up about it. Um, I think... Living a life of regret is exhausting, but it's not exactly something that you can always control depending on uh, what kind of person you are. And as I am right now, I don't feel that I have any regrets in terms of missing any goals. Who knows how I feel about that in a year, two years, so and so from now. But yeah, that's how I feel. And the point is, is that you're like you said it changes and you change as a person the whole the whole thing is that if a goal isn't met like what's the you're still able to do so many things and it's a video game at the end of the day there there is that as well we can talk about it very seriously if we want to but it's still it is still that that party game idea so it's <clears throat> you got to do a lot of a lot of things so i'm not yeah, I'm not trying to make you feel like that there's something that's like you left behind and it shouldn't have been left behind, but it is interesting to hear from from your perspective just because there haven't been there's not really in my opinion a long list of very notable players who have played long enough and then said I'm just going to take a step back from competition. It has happened like Armada, but it's really cool to hear that not only am I stepping away? But like, like I keep saying, you're, you are stepping into new things. So do you want to talk about a little bit more specifically the senior coordinator stuff that you're doing with CLG and what excites you about all of that? Yeah, sure. So my job title is senior coordinator of marketing and team operations. And my day-to-day -day job mostly consists of working with the teams, so, you know, there's separate divisions within CLG, we were a part of, like, eight different games, something like that, um, and I get to work with the players and be able to communicate with the players on, you know, some kind of partnership stuff, sponsorship stuff, uh, things that we need from the team all together, and kind of just really getting into that nitty-gritty with managing the teams like on a very macro level um, but a another great part of it is that it's very personable and I get to talk to these players really often and I think one of the great strengths that I bring into the position is that I have been a player before and so I understand a lot of their struggles in addition uh, a lot of the CLG players already knew me and now it's it's not they don't have like that at least I want to believe that they don't have like that kind of scary like oh this is a staff member I gotta be careful what I'm saying but you know they they know me they know I like to fuck around and still get things done but um I I like to think that I'm 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 a good people's person when it comes to a lot of things maybe not to ask for things um that are are hard pulls but I can at least level with people and relate to them using my past experience. And I'm just really enjoying the job right now. I'm on my fourth week, yes, fourth week. And uh, it's great, it's great. I mean, I, I've been a part of the organization for five and a half years. So what's another four weeks, but you know, <laughs> just from a new perspective. But you, you've described CLG as family before, a very, very important part of your life, the, the organization as a whole, you've, you weren't always part of this big premier esports organization, but you've gotten to stay on. Was that what you had been thinking and, and pulling for the whole way in terms of thinking, well, I can't play this game forever. I can't, but 
were you thinking, I want to stay within CLG? Or was there ever a thought of, you know, maybe I could try like paper sales like Dunder Mifflin or something? <laughs> Uh, great question. Great question. Um, so I always knew that I wanted to work in esports, and I, I didn't always think that it was going to be CLG. In fact, uh, one of the years that I did very well in, I actually was trying to leverage a <laughs> offer from a different org that I will not name. Um, and, uh, the the person who was handling my contracts at the time at CLG was like, wait, like you're talking to another organization like 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 to leave us <laughs> um, <laughs> um but yeah um i always knew that i wanted to work in esports but i thought that i was going to be using my degree uh, a little bit more and my degree is in economics general economics and so i i thought that you know somewhere down the road it would be in you know some kind of data analysis or something like that um, but as it turns out, no, I think my soft skills far outweigh my hard skills and transitioning within CLG was just the natural progression of things. Uh, behind the scenes, I was working on a lot more like uh, staff related things. I was one of the only players that they uh, had in on that kind of stuff. And so it was kind of an easy ask for me to pitch myself and be like, hey, uh, Instead of renewing my 2021 contract, what if we, uh, what if we just put me on the staff? Didn't exactly go like that, but you know, long story short, it worked out. Yeah, the TLDR, it, it, I'm sure they preferred that instead of you going. Yeah, I'm going to another organization and I'm taking SVAT with me. So ha, <laughs> or like I'm glad <laughs> that I'm glad that you're able to find such a. It feels like a very natural uh, next step into the and to that next phase of, of what you do in terms of a uh, career. But not only that, I was curious about the morning routine for work, the, the normal day to day stuff. It's not the pre tournament, like the tournament day morning routine that you described <laughs> on the one HP uh, YouTube channel, right? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, so well, my tournament preparation that is like what i need to be my most optimal like prime self um not to say that i don't bring it every day to work but it's just you know that kind of that kind of energy if you brought that five days a week you would want to gouge your eyes out because that is exhausting um but the pretty much what i like to do before is um get up well before my first meeting and cook myself breakfast i really like to cook in the morning because it gets the creative juices flowing a little bit and uh always always drink something extremely hot that's low-key almost burning your tongue uh i i prefer tea over coffee but sometimes coffee hits just right and uh and listen to some music that's that's really it it's very normal routine and it's nothing at all like my tournament routine, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like if you tried that, you would quickly realize, oh, not everyone is doing the tournament routine for, for the for the office here. And then <laughs> and then it just gets you not into the quite the right mindset. You could kind of come across as a little extreme. I mean, that's what I'm sure that competition has to bring out the most like competitive side of yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um that's like a side of myself that uh, should not come out every single day. I, I don't think I need that level of intensity in my life uh, constantly. And I think uh, having that kind of just be like a little low-key like Hulk mode, I think that's a good thing because that means that I am like ramping up my just like the the adrenaline and energy that I'm putting in and it's just a good way to uh remind yourself how much you want something as well and if you lived like that day to day I think you would just die yeah <laughs> 
Very simply. Oh, I love the simplicity of that. Yes, yes. And I, I understand what you're saying. I myself, like in the past for, for my for my for some of my normal jobs and that's sort of the line of working that I'm in. I'm just like the normal type stuff, the uh, blue collar type work and I, I realized after a while, oh my gosh, I'm putting too much into this and I'm burning myself out. So it's that it's that burnout feeling. And one of the cool things, I saw a CLG YouTube video were about the whole burnout question and how to avoid that, what to do in terms of remedial approaches for it. That's when I first learned about the work, play, rest, pray aspect that Coach Bobby brings, all that stuff. And I'm assuming that you won't be continuing to consult with Coach Bobby over your normal working routines now. But uh, something that I'm curious about, I know that there there was like lessons that Coach Bobby was offering or is offering. I'm not sure exactly what, but that's why I'm asking you can help me fill in the gap here. Did you three, you, SFAT, and Coach Bobby, like do any sort of tutorials or, or lessons for any players at all recently? Well, we don't normally do that kind of stuff, but for the five days of Melee, we did actually get, uh, we raffled off a one-hour coaching session with the CLG boys, and that actually went to uh, a fine strapping lad named Will, uh, also known as Wasabi, and what's interesting is I actually saw he's in this Discord server, um, so that's neat. Yes, um, Wannabe's podcast fame, Wasabi is a homie for sure. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, there we kind of shared some of our secrets, not so secret secrets. And uh, yeah, but th that's not like a normal thing. I think Bobby has coached other people in the past, but it was never with Zach and I. And I'm not really into coaching random people. I've I've taken on like a ton of Melee students uh, in, in my tenure, but, uh, they've always been like close friends and it's never been someone random. Right. Then that's what I've gotten the impression of in, in past interviews where you're like, I think I'd almost rather an apprentice as compared to a student. Right. And, and one of the greatest apprentices to actually by far the greatest is Spark. Spark was, uh, he was one of my apprentices, uh, and we went to UC Santa Cruz together, and, like, he, he was grinding locals really hard, I wasn't attending anything, and he was winning, and then he would come over, and I'd beat his ass really quick, and I'd say, okay, these are the things that I'm catching you for, see him again in another, like, two weeks, and, you know, he's already improved like crazy, but beat his ass again, and, and we talk about things to improve on and uh yeah and now i i think he's probably better than me i i think he at this point spark is better than me uh of course i'm i'm not exactly like in my prime or anything but he's he is amazing man like i think spark is an amazing player i think he's gonna go far absolutely i do agree love seeing spark's performance in the first round of scl the season one, if you will, of Slippy Champions League definitely surprised me when Spark went in one week, in one of the weeks, went all the way to the quote-unquote finals to face Zane, And it didn't go his way, of course, in that particular set, but beat Mango and Nun or something like that on the way there, and I was very impressed. Yes, Spark is an, an amazing Sheik player. Yeah, I think We're also the... Uh... The fact that it, it's online right now is giving him more lab time. And, uh, oh, you don't want to see that kid with more lab time, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Those tech chasers are so crisp already. Yeah. <laughs> I, think I'll just, I think I'll just start crying on every Spacey's behalf when Spark says something to the effect of, yeah, I got like a 300 hertz monitor today. <laughs> Yeah, that guy is a fiend for the, the guaranteed stuff, and I, I respect it so much. Just unashamedly willing to go for it. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a fun mentality to have, I'm sure. So <clears throat> we're getting close to an hour here, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about other things to sort of start to close here that are important to you. I don't want to 
like force anything on you in regards to one of the more recent this week in CLG podcasts, which is a great podcast, like listening to it. The more recent episode being with Holly and Tafo, where you were talking about uh, the the recent the recent things in relation to AAPI violence against AAPI community. I don't want to make you sound like an expert or an ambassador or anything, but I want to give you a, a platform to to share either things related to that or other things that are important to you that are maybe perhaps outside of Melee. Sure thing. Uh, first off, really appreciate you bringing this up, Jesse. Um, also, I'm really impressed with how much research you've done. This is fucking dope. Like, you're, like, low-key nardwaring me right now, so that's good. Oh, okay. I don't um, even know what that is. That is. Oh, gosh. You, you don't know who Nardwar is? Okay, you gotta check out Nardwar, my friend. Nardwar Human Serviette. He's this really quirky guy who uh, interviews famous people, usually musicians, and he's really good at doing his research and asking really uh, interesting and thought-provoking and memory jogging questions from people so yeah i don't know you you've just done your research and and for instance like a nardwar question can range from something as like un unreasonably unimportant and personal like oh so i heard your favorite chip flavor is sea salt and vinegar so i brought you some or it's something like okay so like your neighbor like john hopkins he knew how to do hopscotch, and he taught you this, and that's influenced your song. I, I don't know. Uh, but the point is, Nardwar is extremely, uh, he's extremely well-learned, and uh, you are very well-researched, so I appreciate that. But I'm going to answer your question now. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of this, the subject of the podcast that I was on for This Week in CLG and talking about violence against the AAPI community... I actually recommend that people, um, first off, the most important thing that you can do is listen and absorb the information that's out there about the hate crimes against Asian people and against the Asian community and how that hurts us and, uh, more importantly, how you can support us and listen to our experiences and whatnot. Um, another actionable thing, which was actually told to me from the podcast from Holly, is bystander intervention training. And that is probably what you imagine as a bystander who's witnessing some kind of, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be violence outright, but it could even be like a microaggression or something. Uh, you can equip yourself with the tools to know how to deal with these things. And uh, yeah, so that's what I've got on that subject. No, any anything that you're willing to say, I appreciate. And I I don't want to add to uh, really any sort of thought myself because I want you to be the, the one whose voice matters more in this particular instance. But I really appreciate you talking about that. And I guess I'll just try to help with the bio your bio on twitter one of the things that you say in your bio is love each other i think that's a that's a great place to start it's it that's what it ultimately comes down to even strangers that are that are around it you can just it's the act of kindness the act of love that you can show and that helps to make the world a better place one day at a time one step at a time you get it but thank you thank you for 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 sharing yeah, I, I really quick want to touch base on on uh, how I think about love each other okay, as well. Okay, yes, please. Uh, love each other in my bio, of course, can mean anything to anyone, and that can mean literal, like, being in love with someone, but I, I think what's more important is just loving uh, being and, and existing, and I, I don't want to make it sound too existential, but I think loving each other can also mean appreciating other people's existence for what they are and not trying to put them in a box and seeing it for what it is and just being accepting over it all and not trying to make anything anything crazy you know i i think love can be a very simple thing and for what it means for each other i think that's just respect and acceptance and all that good yes 
Absolutely. You put it so much better than me. That is awesome. Yes, absolutely agree. So the very last thing I want to ask about or to highlight is the Austin Melee Bender and the top 10 doubles teams of all time. You being named along with SFAT for Team PewFAT. I have such an appreciation for, for Austin Melee. I just wanted to hear from, from your own perspective, your reaction to that video, going through it and watching at a it's such a coincidental timing thing where you knew what you were going to be talking about and announcing soon. And then that video comes out and you see it. Yeah. Um, and I also saw their podcast. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, tell them or anything, but I saw their podcast. And one of the things that they rolled on the, uh, roulette thing was that they killed me. They killed pew pew you by releasing that video. And I retired like (laughs) four days later. Um, but, uh, that, that was just really funny, but I really, really, really from the bottom of my heart, deeply fucking appreciate the Alston Melee guys for putting that video out. Um, they really did their research. They were, were really, really good about it and helped tell the story between Zach and I, and they went beyond the game to like our personal relationship and just like the history behind everything and yeah it could not have come at a better time i mean that was an emotional week for me as it was because it's like well damn like you know this this chapter's closing and this video comes out and uh zach just links it to me one night and he's just like yo watch this i'm like okay i guess i was like 30 minutes i'm I'm not watching this shit and then like i started watching (laughs) i was like dude this is amazing like this is fucking awesome and like it it gets it starts counting down the top three and we get to the third i was like all right well are we gonna be first are we gonna be second and then second was like the lindgren brothers like fuck yeah we're first okay let's go uh but then when it actually came around to uh our segment i was like wow this is really good stuff. And so I got to shout out Alston Melee for for uh, using their platform to, to showcase an aspect of doubles and my life and Zach's life. And just for doing it in such a great way. Like, like goddamn, like, hats off. Like, you guys are awesome. So super duper extra shout outs to Alston Melee. And actually, you know, the reason why I'm doing this interview right now is in part largely in part of because of that video um and i i can't lie i didn't know who alston melee was prior to that but i will for sure know them going forward yes and that's that's what i wanted to say you are you're you're someone who strikes me as a very relational person that relationships are so important to you that you're willing, of course, to to go on to different people's things that you know and you've had a previous prior relationship with. And so I thought to myself, yeah, I'm not going to talk to anybody like Kevin Pew Pew U Toy. Of course not. But then Austin Melee said to me, well, we're thinking about doing different things for the Austin Melee Bender, which is a super awesome event that's happening right now as you, the listeners, are listening, that, Jesse, do you want to help out at all with this? And I said, absolutely. Yeah, sure. I was thinking about this or that and and threw out a few suggestions. But one of the things that I said was, look, I'm just throwing this out as as an idea. I think it would be really cool for someone, either myself or somebody else. Somebody's got to talk to talk to Pew Pew You because it's so cool that, of course, you've had such a great career in terms of your 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 active competitive years. But I, I guess how do you uh not that you have to have a tell-all interview or whatever like make it sort of like that but i thought is there a way that somebody can talk to ppu in terms of an interview and they said oh yeah sure and then they messaged me a few days later and they said actually we were thinking of having you do that and i was like what (laughs) so it they are they're very very nice and they are very inspirational to me for for what i'm doing so I appreciate you being willing that that as well. I appreciate you being willing to come on, even though this is the first time we've we've spoken, and it's all because Austin Melee in every single video they do and their content is they care so much, and you can just see that in what they do and the content that they produce that they want to highlight the positive things and push forward to continue that that positivity. It's it's so wonderful to see, and Austin Melee is awesome, the best. Yeah. 
Um, the Alston Melee guys, I didn't even know what they looked like until I hit that podcast, and, uh, I just really appreciate the way they carry themselves and the way that they talk about all the different kinds of stuff in Smash. They're really not afraid to, like, inject their own personal bits into what they talk about, and I just really appreciate those guys. So, yeah, shout-outs to Austin Melee, and shout-outs to everyone who's sticking around for this long, in- including you, Kevin. Thank you so much for being on Bottom of the Smash Mountain and on the Austin Melee Bender. Thank you so much for all of your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on as well. I really enjoyed this, and you were a great interviewer. So for the listeners at home as well, appreciate y'all, and, uh, yeah, you guys will hear from me soon. Awesome. Yes. You will hear from him at, I forgot this almost, holy cow, at CLG underscore pew pew you on Twitter. And please also follow the CLG gaming Twitter handle as well. That would be Twitter slash CLG and then aiming. You get it. The G is both for (laughs) gaming and gaming. So I'll link those in the podcast description if you care to listen to this again. You get it. Thank you so much for being on, Kevin. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Bottom of the Smash Mountain. Before you get going, please like the video. Where are you going? You left. Hmm. Well, for those of you who are still here, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment your favorite part of the interview. Hey, is there a timestamps person that wants to post them? Because for now, the only thing that I'm doing for timestamps is the start of the interview and the end of the interview. You're welcome, YouTube. I just, (laughs) I couldn't be bothered. At least for now, I couldn't be bothered. So if you also want to listen to this podcast in its entirety, I have exclusive podcast audio that is separate from the audio that I post here onto YouTube. So if that's something that's interesting to you, you can check out Bottom of the Smash Mountain on your favorite podcasting platform. Seriously, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all kinds of podcasts. So Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.